So hello everybody from my bunker here in San Diego. I wanted to thank Gary and the IDG for the opportunity to present our work. And this is a bit of an unusual situation because I'm giving my talk before the introduction, but thank you nonetheless, Gary, for the introduction. So I'm gonna tell you about my favorite enzyme, protein kinase C, and how it is deregulated in disease. The idea being that if we can understand the mechanisms that regulate or deregulate it, we'll be able to make more intelligent decisions for targeting it therapeutically. But as I was putting my talk together, I realized that this was actually a story of protein IC and quarantine. The mechanisms that release it from quarantine, the importance of wearing a mask and of being socially distant, and the bad things that happen when it doesn't wear its mask and it's not socially distant. So the activity and function of the enzyme is exquisitely tuned. And this is nicely illustrated by actually looking at its activity in real time in live cells, which we're able to do with these genetically encoded reporters that we developed many years ago in collaboration with Roger Chen. So these are HeLa cells and we stimulate them with an agonist histamine and we see these really nice oscillations in intracellular calcium. Well, when we monitor in these same cells the activity of PKC, we find that its activity is phase locked with the calcium oscillations. When calcium goes up, PKC activity goes up. And when calcium goes down, our reporter becomes dephosphorylated and protein IC as a result of protein IC having lost its activity. So it is really an exquisitely tuned activity, very sensitive to its second messengers. I just want to pay, pay homage here to Roger Chen, uh, with whom we developed these reporters. And what he used to say is that uh, these biosensors allow us to have private conversations with cells. You can tweak them with agonists or inhibitors and they will talk right back to you. So the activity, as I mentioned, is exquisitely tuned and that's really important not to have pathophysiologies. So I saw my daughter one day who's a ballerina balancing on point on this kind of wobbly BOSU ball. And I said, wait, you're protein kinase C. It's like so easy for something to go wrong. You have to have all your muscles and everything right in order to, to maintain this balance. So I'm gonna tell you about the inputs that regulate this balance, what happens when the enzyme is unbalanced, and then I'm gonna tell you about this quarantine. Protein kinase C is a family of enzymes, and there are three subclasses the conventional PKCs that are regulated by both diacylglycerol and calcium. And these are the ones that I'm going to focus on primarily. The novel PKCs that are regulated only by diacylglycerol, and then the atypical PKCs that are regulated by neither second messenger, but rather they have a PB1 protein-protein interaction module that allows them to bind protein scaffolds, which then activates them. They're all activated though by a common mechanism which is release of an autoinhibitory pseudosubstrate present in all subclasses, which normally occupies the substrate binding cavity of the kinase domain, but upon binding of the correct second messengers or protein partners, it's released from the substrate binding cavity. The C-terminal half houses the kinase domain, and this is um, modified by phosphorylation at three highly conserved positions. This phosphorylation at these positions happens shortly after biosynthesis. And we're able to monitor this in pulse chase experiments because there's a very nice electrophoretic mobility shift that accompanies the phosphorylation of the two C-terminal sites. So in these pulse chase analyses, we find that PKC gets processed by phosphorylation with a half time of approximately 30 minutes. So it's slow. And what it's doing during that, that time is something I'm going to focus on in the second half of the talk. So these phosphorylations are put on by the following mechanisms. PDK1 phosphorylates the activation loop at the entrance to the active site, and that will be magenta for the rest of the talk. The hydrophobic motif at the extreme C terminus is the last phosphate to go on, and that's put on by intramolecular autophosphorylation. And then another residue at the C-terminus, which we name the turn motif, is regulated by a mechanism I'll discuss later on by torque 2 
When protein kinase C is fully phosphorylated at these priming positions, that allows it to adopt this auto-inhibited conformation, which is very stable. In response to second messengers, which generate calcium, the calcium will bind PKC in the cytosol, and the enzyme is moving around, diffusing, bouncing on and off the membrane. If it's bound to calcium, it'll get retained at the membrane. It'll bind PIP2 via a PIP2 binding surface that it has, and that's important for retaining it specifically at plasma membrane where this phospholipid exists. Once at the membrane, it's able to find its membrane embedded ligand, diisoglycerol, and that produces the conformational change that expels the pseudosubstrate and that allows downstream signaling. This movement of PKC can be examined in many ways. This is just an example of GFP tagging PKC. You add an agonist and you can see this very nice reversible translocation to membranes. So the PKC that most people study in the cell is this mature, fully functional form. And if you lice cells open, you're gonna find the PKC is this mature phosphorylated form. But I just want to remind you that it's processed by these phosphorylations that involve PDK1 and TORC2. Formal esters are potent tumor promoters, and they play an important role in the story of protein kinase C. These compounds are found in croton oil in plant species such as euphorbia. Here's the active ingredient, the formal esters, and it's been known for some time that they're potent tumor promoters. So if we take a subthreshold amount of a carcinogen and paint it on the skin of a mouse, nothing will happen. But if it's followed by repeated and closely spaced applications of formal esters, eventually a papilloma and a carcinoma will appear. Formal esters bind the C1 domain of proteins. And I mentioned that protein IC has a C1 domain. Other proteins also have them, but protein IC is probably the main formal ester receptor. So because binding of ligand to the C1 domain activates PKC and that the normal agonist is diisoglycerol, the dogma was, was um, established that protein IC must be an oncogene because it was binding these very potent tumor-promoting formal esters. I was horrified actually the other day to find that you can buy croton oil and apparently it's useful for hair care and skin care Although if you read the user reviews, most people complain about the severe irritation and lesions that it causes on the skin. Protein high C as a consequence has been targeted in cancer clinical trials for three decades. And these clinical trials, these inhibitors of PKC have pretty much failed. This guy here saying our trials show that the new drug performs no better than placebo. The smart guy's going, maybe we should invest in placebos. In fact, investing in placebos in the case of PKC inhibitors would have been a better idea. This is a meta-analysis of non-small lung cell cancer clinical trials, five clinical trials, and this is a forced plot. So things on the left side mean they're better. So patients that got chemotherapy alone had a better outcome than patients that had chemotherapy coupled with PKC inhibitors. So what was going on? A very talented graduate student in my lab at the time, Karina Antal, approached the problem. She looked at all the cancer-associated mutations that are available now on databases like TCGA and found that there were cancer-associated mutations throughout the domain structure of PKC and present in every single isozyme. She looked at them to ask the question whether they were enhancing or inhibiting activity and found that they were pretty much um, all loss of function. She didn't find a single mutation that was enhancing activity, indicating then that PKC is actually tumor suppressive and not oncogenic. This is a more recent analysis by Leon in Kanan's lab, looking at the conventional PKCs, and you can see there are really no hot spots. There's a couple of warm spots, but throughout the entire domain structure, PKC is basically replete with cancer-associated mutations. Their analysis also showed that one of the PKCs, PKC beta, the conventional one that our lab studies a lot, is the 11th highest, has the 11th highest mutation rate of 545 kinases. And so, as I mentioned, these mutations are generally loss of function. We've looked at about 100 and haven't found a single gain of function mutation. To show that they're actually functioning in a tumor suppressive manner, 
Karina took a cancer, colon cancer cell line, the DLD1 cancer cell line, and it has a point mutation in PKC beta that's inactivating. It's in the kinase domain. She CRISPR corrected that bad allele to a good allele and showed in a xenograft model that correcting the bad PKC to a good PKC suppressed tumor growth pretty significantly. So here's the parental cell line with a bad PKC causes a tumor, corrected to a good PKC, no tumor. It's very relevant to mention that this colon cancer cell line had many other mutations, and most strikingly, it had an oncogenic mutation in KRAS. So even in the context of oncogenic KRAS, having good PKC was sufficient to suppress this oncogenic potential of KRAS. When Karina looked at growth in 3D, she found that correcting the bad PKC to a good PKC significantly decreased growth in 3D, and that the PKC that was wild type was haploinsufficient, meaning that by having one allele of PKC, it wasn't as good at a controlling cell growth as having two alleles, so haploinsufficient. And on top of that, if one of the alleles is an uh, inactivating mutation, it acts in a dominant negative fashion. We collaborated with uh, Patrick Keeley's at the University of Limerick to show that in patients, colon cancer patients, if we look at the protein levels of PKC beta at distal tissue away from the tumor, patients that had a set point of having relatively high amounts of PKC beta had a much better survival outcome than patients that had low PKC beta. So it's pretty clear that at least PKC beta is a bona fide tumor suppressor. So why is PKC function so easily lost? This all comes back to this idea that it needs to be very tightly auto-inhibited, and when it's auto-inhibited, it's stable. So if we make any mutations that disrupt these auto-inhibitory contacts, we're going to have this uh, constitutively active PKC that's very unstable and sensitive to degradation. The structure of PKC beta, part of it, was solved by Hurley and coworkers about 10 years ago, we looked at the crystal packing and found a different packing that made sense with the biochemistry. We validated it by doing, uh, uh, looking at the surface interactions here and came up with the structure in which the kinase domain not only is inhibited by the pseudo substrate occupying the subject binding cavity, but by having that C2 domain clamp on top of that to really hold that pseudo substrate in place and make sure that a lot of things have to happen before the enzyme can be liberated and have activity. This is Karina and Julia trying to figure out how all these different pieces of PKC fit together, a puzzle that we're still working on. So the pseudo substrate is required for autoinhibition. If we use our genetically encoded reporter, uh, you transfect in PKC beta in cost cells, we add UTP, we get nice activation. As the second messengers decay, activity goes down, and if we force activation by adding four balesters, we see this robust activity. And again, we can reverse it by adding inhibitors. So as Roger Chen said, we can play with the PKC in the cell. We can talk to the cells. If we have a construct of PKC in which we delete the pseudo substrate, it's constitutively active, but it's perfectly functional. We add inhibitors and we can drop all that activity. This is PKC alpha. And the other two calcium regulated PKCs show the same constitutive activity when we delete the pseudo substrate. We were very surprised when we began doing these studies that these constructs of PKC that are deleted in the pseudo substrate, although they're fully functionally active, have no phosphate at any of these priming phosphorylations that I stressed at the beginning of my talk. So, with phosphospecific antibodies, we have nice labeling of the wild type enzyme. But each one of these isozymes that's constitutively active because it doesn't have a pseudo substrate has no phosphate at that position. I won't show you the data for this, but we know that the phosphate must have been on at the beginning when PKC was made, because if we put alanine at these phosphoreceptor positions, we do not make an active PKC. So the phosphates have gone on, but then they have been removed. Well, this unphosphorylated PKC, it's not auto inhibited and it's in a very unstable conformation. If we add cyclohexamide to stop protein synthesis and look at the turnover of wild type PKC, the phosphorylated species, this upper mobility, is really quite stable. It's got a half time of over 48 hours. But this lower band, a little bit of it that's not phosphorylated, 
gets degraded very quickly. And similarly, if we neutralize the pseudo substrate by putting the changing the positively charged residues to alanine, we end up with a constitutively active enzyme in the soap and conformation that turns over very quickly. There's a tenfold difference in the uh, turnover rate if you don't have nice auto inhibition. This degradation of PKC that's active has been known for a very long time. This is a classic experiment of Peter Blumberg's adding formal esters to cells and showing that all the diacylglycerol regulated PKCs, alpha, delta, epsilon as examples, basically get degraded. They get downregulated. And before the advent of SI RNA, the best way to deplete cells of PKC was to treat with full esters overnight. So PKC in an open conformation is very sensitive to degradation. Illustrated here, full esters glue it in this open conformation and it gets dephosphorylated and degraded. So we wanted to ask the question, what is the phosphatase that is dephosphorylating newly synthesized PKC? And we wanted to know if it was this phosphatase flip that our lab had discovered about 15 years ago. At the time, we were quite obsessed with PKC autophosphorylating at the hydrophobic motif and AKT also doing the same. We had a paper showing that for AKT. So we thought the critical regulator might be a phosphatase. And we reasoned that because both of these enzymes work at the membrane, that we might have a phosphatase that had a membrane targeting module. And specifically, we reasoned that PDK1 has a pH domain, AKT has a pH domain. What if there's a phosphatase out there that had a pH domain? So we looked at the databases and we found a gene predicted to encode a protein that had a phosphatase domain and a pH domain. We cloned it, we called it FLIP after its domain structure, pH domain leucine rich protein phosphatase. It belongs to the PPM family of phosphatases. Here's FLIP1 and FLIP2. And they are noteworthy because they're a part of the PP2C phosphatases that are resistant to uh, phosphatase inhibitors such as ocadaic acid and colliculin. We showed in previous work that uh, FLIP dephosphorylates AKT at the hydrophobic motif by a mechanism that depends on an intact PDZ ligand, and that it dephosphorylates PKC at the hydrophobic motif by a mechanism that depends on the pH domain. So I will just summarize uh, what we found because this was published about a year ago. And that was that newly synthesized PKC associates very tightly with FLIP, which binds to the C1A domains. Then we have this so slow, mysterious 30 minute lag. Something happens and it gets phosphorylated by mTORC2 and PDK1. And the immediate consequence of having these phosphorylations is that it is now able to adopt the stable auto inhibited conformation. So, this is a very stable state. In this state, it is mutually exclusive with binding FLIP. So, FLIP binds determinants on the C1 domains that are involved in later on interacting with the kinase domain. So, once it adopts the auto inhibited conformation, FLIP is expelled. But what if we have aberrant PKC? What if, for example, we have cancer-associated mutations in the pseudo-substrate that don't allow auto-inhibition? In this case, it's stuck in this open conformation. FLIP remains bound to PKC. It sees this nice little phosphate here that's being put on by autophosphorylation, and as soon as it goes on, it immediately dephosphorylates it. And this dephosphorylation then triggers this downregulation cascade where PKC gets eventually degraded. So FLIP is a gatekeeper to regulate PKC processing. It provides basically a quality control mechanism to ensure that aberrant PKC does not accumulate in the cell. The artist who drew a cover that, that was on the uh, uh, issue when the paper came out had an interesting way of depicting this. She depicts PKC as an armadillo, tightly binding onto its phosphate. This is the hydrophobic motif phosphate and having the phosphatase flip longingly looking at that. But as long as this armadillo is auto-inhibited and held together because it's got that phosphate there, both the phosphate are safe and the armadillo is safe. It's not going to get degraded. But if anything happens so that it opens up and lets go of that phosphate, the phosphatase flip, the beagle takes the phosphate, and then the degradatory uh, pathways take over and the enzyme gets degraded. So stable auto-inhibited with a phosphate.
The um, biochemical data showing us that if PKC is not phosphorylated, it gets degraded, was validated in a collaboration with Gordon Mills, where we did reverse phase protein arrays to look at the phosphorylation state and total levels of PKC in over 5,000 tumor samples. And this showed that if you have PKC, it's phosphorylated at the hydrophobic motif. If there's no phosphate, there's no PKC. There's a beautiful one-to-one -one correlation between PKC and phosphorylation, really exemplifying that if you have PKC in the cell, it's quantitatively phosphorylated at the hydrophobic motif site. This is actually not the case for AKT, which is also regulated by the hydrophobic motif phosphate and also dephosphorylated by FLIP at the site. But in the case of AKT, there's really no correlation. Phosphate at the hydrophobic motif on AKT controls its acute activity, but not its stability. Very different from PKC, where phosphate doesn't control activity, it controls the stability. We focused in on pancreatic cancer because we had other evidence to suggest that the levels of FLIP, the negative regulator, were important in determining how much PKC was present in these uh, cancers, in these pancreatic cancers. So again, doing this reverse phase protein uh, array analysis, we find that if we have low levels of the negative regulator FLIP, that correlates with high levels of phosphorylation at the hydrophobic motif. So here's the correlation. Furthermore, if we stratify patients that have high levels of PKC, either alpha or beta, versus low, we find that the patients that have high levels of the protein have a much better survival outcome than patients that have a low level. So we can stratify the patients in this cohort, ones that have high PKC and as a consequence low negative regulator have a good prognosis, and ones that have high FLIP but low PKC have a poor prognosis. So summarizing this part of my talk, protein high C is acting as the brakes to oncogenic signaling. And we think that one of the mechanisms that it does so is by supporting and promoting the activity of tumor suppressors and by opposing the activity of oncogenes. Two of these are KRAS, which is phosphorylated and inactivated by PKC, and also the EGF receptor that gets phosphorylated and internalized by PKC. So it's opposing oncogenic pathways and promoting tumor suppressive pathways. I'm just going to spend one slide on gain of function mutations because that was in the original title of my talk before I decided to focus more on the quarantine aspects. There are gain of function mutations of PKC and they're associated with degenerative diseases. And they are gain of function by a very unique special way of evading quality control degradation. In Alzheimer's disease, there are germline mutations in the catalytic domain that enhance the KCAD of the enzyme by about 30% without affecting the on-off dynamics. So these enzymes are more active when they're turned on, but they're not in this label conformation any longer than a wild-type enzyme. And in cerebellar ataxia, there are mutations that are clustered in the C1B domain that make the enzyme not be auto-inhibited, but they're stable and resistant to downregulation. So we think there's something unique about the C1 domain, the C1B domain in particular, where there might be ubiquitination sites or binding sites for E3 ligases, and in cerebellar ataxia, these are mutated to allow a constitutively active PKC without causing degradation. So this is the scheme of all of PKC, and I said right at the beginning I was going to talk to you about quarantine and what's happening in those first 30 minutes, and this is something that's been perplexing us for so many years. So it's actually been really rewarding to finally have a handle at what might be happening during those 30 minutes of the maturation of PKC. So it's been known for a while, uh, ever since David Sabatini published that TORC2 regulates uh, the hydrophobic motif of AKT, that you need functional TORC2 in order to get the priming phosphorylations on PKC. And TORC2 is a complex of the kinase mTOR with components such as SYN1 and Richter. So in wild-type mouse embryonic fibroblasts, PKC is expressed nicely, and we have a nice phosphorylation at all the processing sites. But if we delete 
any of these components. We'll focus on SIM1 right here. The levels of PKC are really low and there's no phosphorylation at any of these priming sites. So this has been shown many times that you need TORC2 to process PKC. And if we look at the activity in MEFs that are lacking SIN1, we really have no significant activity of PKC because there's basically very little enzyme there. We can actually rescue this phosphorylation by adding back SIN1. So in these minus minus MEFs, the PKC is a faster mobility species. There's not so much of it there because it's unstable, no phosphates. And if we transfect in SIN1, we see this nice mobility shift indicative of quantitative phosphorylation at the two C terminal sites. And when we probe with the phosphoantibodies, nice phosphorylation. So SIN1 can rescue that phosphorylation defect. We've known for many years that what TORC2 does is not to phosphorylate the hydrophobic motif as has been proposed. Because if we put phosphomimetics at the hydrophobic motif, and in fact also at the turn motif, that doesn't rescue the TORC2 requirement. And I've just chosen one slide to show that. So we can look at the rate at which PKC translocates to membranes as a measure of whether it's in this open conformation or closed auto-inhibited native conformation. Because if it's nicely auto-inhibited and there's nothing wrong with the enzyme, it translocates to membranes in response to forbal esters pretty slowly with a half time of around eight minutes. So this is wild type enzyme translocating slowly. But if we have PKC that can't be auto-inhibited for all sorts of reasons, that we can, any of these mutations that I talked to you about in cancer where it can't auto-inhibit, we have this much faster translocation because now the membrane targeting modules are much more exposed. So in SIN1 minus minus MEFs, where PKC does not become phosphorylated, in blue, the wild type enzyme translocates very quickly, about 10 times faster. And if we transfect in a PKC that's got phosphomimetics, glutamates, at these two sites on the C-terminal tail, it does nothing. It doesn't rescue it. It still migrates very slowly. And that's not because PKC doesn't like glutamates and they're not phosphomimetics, because if we express the glutamate phosphomimetics in the wild-type cells, it acts perfectly fine. It acts like wild-type enzyme. So this tells us that the TORC2 requirement has is not because it's phosphorylating those two residues. It's something different, which is why it's been driving us crazy for all these years. So we did find a way to bypass the TORC2 requirement, and that's through PDK1. So in a normal pulse chase experiment, we see our PKC going from this unphosphorylated species with a half time of about 30 minutes to this slower mobility form that's phosphorylated. If we inhibit TOR, by adding the inhibitor taurin, we prevent the processing of PKC. So nice demonstration that you do need the activity of TORC2 in order to process PKC. Well, if you overexpress PDK1, you completely rescue, and in fact, you accelerate the processing of PKC. So even though we have taurin here, we can rescue the processing of PKC by overexpressing PDK1. And this rescue depends on the intrinsic catalytic activity of PDK1. A kinase dead PDK1 is not able to do that. This rescue also depends on the intrinsic catalytic activity of PKC. And that's not surprising to us because we've known for years and years that it autophosphorylates, but it is probably worth showing. So in SIN1 minus minus MEFs, PKC migrates as this faster mobility species that's not phosphorylated. If we add back SIN1, we get this upper mobility band that's phosphorylated now at all of these priming sites. If we, instead of SIN1, add PDK1, we're also able to rescue a substantial amount of the PKC to that upper band. But it only rescues phosphorylation at the hydrophobic motif. It doesn't rescue phosphorylation at the turn motif suggesting that this turn motif might be a bona fide substrate of TORC2, but for certain, the hydrophobic motif um, is not. If we have a kinase dead PDK1, it doesn't rescue. So we have this faster mobility, no phosphate on the hydrophobic motif. And if we have a kinase dead PKC, so no catalytic activity, also that cannot be rescued. 
So normally when we have functional TORC2, we get phosphates at all three positions. If we inhibit TORC2, we get no phosphates anywhere. But if we have inhibited TORC2, but add back PDK1, we're able to restore phosphorylation on the activation loop and the hydrophobic motif, but not on this turn motif. The same is true for AKT. So exact same experiment with AKT. So here we've overexpressed AKT in SIN1 minus minus cells. So there's very little phosphorylation at any of these sites. If we add back SIN1, we get phosphorylation at the turn motif and we get phosphorylation at the hydrophobic motif. If we add back instead PDK1, we also get phosphorylation at the hydrophobic motif, but not the turn motif. Nice phosphorylation at the activation loop. And this phosphorylation depends on the intrinsic catalytic activity of PDK1. And it also depends on the intrinsic catalytic activity of PDK1. So if you focus um, your attention on the graph that summarize, uh, summarizes um, three different experiments here, and what SIN1 does is it allows phosphorylation on the hydrophobic motif and on the turn motif. And what PDK1 does is it allows phosphorylation on the hydrophobic and the activation loop. And this rescue of phosphorylation on the hydrophobic motif depends on catalytically active PDK1 and on AKT having it, its own intrinsic catalytic activity. So same thing that I showed you for PKC. You need TORC2 for all three phosphates, but, and if you don't have TORC2, nothing happens, but you're able to rescue phosphorylation at the activation and hydrophobic motif by PDK1. So what is going on? So another very talented student in my lab, Tim Baffey, was perplexing about this through his entire PhD thesis. And it turns out that there's two types of PKCs. There are some that are not regulated by TORC2, so some of the novel PKCs, and then there are some that are regulated by TORC2, so all the calcium regulated ones, some of the novel PKCs and the atypical PKCs are regulated by TORC2. So he was making all these chimeras splicing on pieces of the C tails of the TORC2 and TORC2 independent kinases, and finally he had this epiphany and he noticed that every single TORC2 regulated PKC had this highly conserved threonine, seven amino acids before this known turn motif that I've been talking about, this orange residue right here. Whereas the TORC2 independent PKCs did not have a threonine at that position. Furthermore, if he looked at the kinome tree at all the known kinases that are regulated by TORC2, every single one of them had this invariant threonine. And kinases that are not TORC2 regulated, like PKA, do not have that threonine there. So he looked at the tree and he colored in red all the kinases that have this threonine, seven amino acids before the turn motif. And some of these kinases have not been identified yet as TORC2 regulated kinases. So that'll be interesting to see if there's new TORC2 substrates because of this. So Wayland in Kanan's lab uh, did a bioinformatic analysis of this. And he found that this motif was conserved all the way back to amoeba. So animals and yeast have got this, and he kind of divided it into the kinases that have this conserved threonine and the kinases that don't. So there's a whole group of kinases that have this conserved all the way back down to amoeba. And when he separated these into the ones that had the motif, these were for the, um, for the ones in, in animals and yeast. These are the known kinases that I've been talking about. So we found it in PKC, but it's present in all of these other TORC2 regulated kinases, but not present in ones like PKA. So indicating that this motif might be functionally rather important. If we put an alanine at this new residue, let me start with AKT. So if we put an alanine at this new residue in AKT and look at its activity using our biosensors and cells, it completely abolishes activity. If we put an alanine at the well-characterized turn motif in AKT, which we and others have done before, that really doesn't do anything. But an alanine at this new motif really um, kills activity. When we do the same type of analysis with protein IC, 
if we put an alanine at either the new motif or the um, existing turn motif, it doesn't really do too much to activity. But if we put an alanine at both of these, it completely abolishes activity. So the graph here is from the live cell imaging data. So mutation of this new motif and the turn motif kills PKC activity. And for AKT, simply mutating this new motif kills AKT activity. So what is going on with this? Well, we did an overlay of one of the components of TORC2, SYN1, because that's the component of TORC2 that brings the kinases to its substrates. And in this overlay that I'm not going to show you, we identified this region of the tail where this new motif is as the binding determinants that allow SYN1 to bind to PKC. And this uh, surface um, on SYN1 that binds PKC, it's been characterized before. So the crim domain of SYN1 has an acidic surface on it that recruits kinase substrates to the TORC2 complex. And Peter Parker and Shiozaki and coworkers had shown many years ago that this acidic loop on the crim domain of SYN1 is what is binding PKC and other AGC substrate kinases. So we took SYN1 and we docked it on a structure of PKC beta and found that the crim domain bound to this docking analysis to this region where this uh, new phosphorylation motif is. So this is the active site tether that Kanan's lab has characterized very beautifully. This is a highly conserved NFD, and this phenylalanine points into the ATP um, binding pocket. So, and there's an alpha helix that is formed here. So SYN1 docks right on top. And if we zoom in a little bit, uh, you can see the threonine right here. It's this new threonine. And here's these phenylalanines that are, and an arginine that's highly conserved over here that's binding very nicely to SYN1. So this appears to be a SYN1 docking surface. Well, we decided to call this the TOR interaction motif. And it's kind of funny because the graduate student who did all this work um, is called Tim. So Tim has left his mark on PKC, or maybe his parents were very savvy and, and, and the turn interaction motif made its mark on Tim. So now I'm gonna tell you about PKC and dimerization before I wrap it up. So Susan Taylor has been asking me for years, is PKC a dimer? And, I, and I, I keep telling her, no, like stop asking me. And the mature PKC that's fully phosphorylated is a monomer, size exclusion, single molecule biophysical analyses. The mature PKC is definitely a monomer. But we never thought about maybe the unphosphorylated enzyme could be a dimer. So Tim was at his thesis committee about a year before he graduated. And Susan, who was on the committee, said, is PKC a dimer? And I said, no. And Tony Hunter, who was also on the committee, very wisely said, I wonder if there are any structures of the kinase domain where one might see a dimer interface. And as soon as he said that, I remembered this beautiful paper that came out by Steve Grant um, at Pfizer uh, almost 15 years ago now, where they had taken full-length PKC, chopped it in half with trypsin, and then crystallized the kinase moiety. And there was a beautiful dimer interface which they largely ignored. And when I read it, I noticed it, but I also kind of largely ignored. So as Tim was continuing to give his committee meeting, we, the committee members, were paying no attention because I pulled up the structure on my iPad and there's this beautiful head-to-head -head dimer mediated by this Tim helix motif that I have been talking about. So we then went on to ask, does it actually dimerize? And we collaborated with uh, Eddie Stefan's lab at Innsbruck, who's got this luciferase assay. And the idea was that if PKC is a dimer, he'll be able to get a signal. And if it's not a dimer, there will be no signal. To make a long story short, he's able to detect with this luciferase complementation assay, a little bit of dimerization of the wild type enzyme. But if there are alanines at the turn motif and the new tin motif, there is enhanced dimerization. And we look at, if we look at this small amount of dimerization that we see for the wild type enzyme, that is competed out 
by adding increasing amounts of unlabeled PKC. And that's important because it tells us that it's not PKC that's aggregating, it's actually dimerizing together and we can compete it out by adding more unlabeled PKC. And if we try to compete it out with the alanine mutants, so alanines at these two phos presumed phosphorylation sites, this alanine mutant is extremely effective at, comp at competing out. So there's dimerization and it's much greater when we have alanines at those positions. These are some co-IP experiments that I'm just gonna quickly skip over. So we then reasoned, okay, maybe we can pharmacologically take advantage of this. What if we split apart a dimer of newly synthesized PKC? Will that accelerate the processing of PKC? So we collaborated with Eileen Kennedy at the University of Georgia, and she designed for us these stapled peptides that were designed to have a very high affinity for this interface. So here's our Tim dimer interface, these are peptides that she designed for us. You can see the NFD here. And so they're designed to be, they're stapled. So they're nice helices. They're designed to have a higher affinity for this, uh, these uh, helices than the intrinsic affinity for the, the two helices here. So the question was, if we take PKC and have this um, stapled helix present during its biosynthesis, are we going to make more PKC because we're going to facilitate splitting apart so it can move on with its life. And sure enough, when we um, added these dimerization disruptors, they promoted the processing of PKC. So I'll just show you quantitatively on the graph, these are the gels on the um, left hand side, that when we have either one of these two stapled peptides, we have a greater fraction of our total PKC that's phosphorylated at the turn motif and at the hydrophobic motif. So having these peptides gave us more higher steady state levels of phosphorylated processed PKC. So putting it all together then, we have PKC, which when it's newly synthesized, we think is a head-to-head -head dimer through this Tim helix interaction region. And we think that that's very important for protecting PKC from degradation. At this point, torque 2 will come along. It'll bind to that TIM motif, so it's pulling apart the dimer. It's competing then for this, these two PKCs coming together. Syn will, will come and bind instead and pull them apart. This then exposes the C-terminal tail, which is the binding site for PDK1. So PDK1 can now bind phosphorylate the activation loop, triggering this intramolecular autophosphorylation at the hydrophobic motif. So this is the so slow step. PKC is kind of in a holding pattern until there's enough torque 2 to come along, bind, rip it apart, and then bang, 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 all these things happen very quickly. If there's any defect in any of these steps, so there's no torque 2 or no PDK1 or PKC can't autophosphorylate, it's in this very labile conformation and it gets shunted to degradation. And this is the species, as I've mentioned at the beginning, that's a signal incompetent transient activation. Well, this is when it occurred to me that this is really a story of PKC in quarantine. So when it's first made, it's kind of safe because it's in this tightly knit family where it's interacting with itself and all these things that are susceptible to ubiquination and degradation are kind of masked because we've got this nice stable dimer. It exits from quarantine by the help of torque 2, which splits apart the dimer, allowing PDK1 to bind, put on these key phosphates, and allowing this very important autophosphorylation at the hydrophobic motif. And so now it's auto-inhibited, it's out, it's socially distancing, it's no longer very close to another PKC, it's got its mask on, so it's got its pseudo-substrate nicely auto-inhibiting itself, it's got its mask held on by having phosphate on the hydrophobic motif and on the term motif, and in this conformation it's very safe and it's gonna have a pretty long life. When it's activated then, it's kind of important that it's transiently activated because it puts itself in a vulnerable situation. So the mask needs to come on. It's kind of hanging on a little bit because you've got this anchor of the hydrophobic motif. Um, so it's very transiently activated there and it's safe only if this is a short period of time. If it's four ballesters and it's stuck in this open conformation, it's going to be 
demasked by the anti-maskers. So this is FLIP hovering around in the cell. It's against masks. It's going to dephosphorylate that hydrophobic motif. That's going to lose the ability of that mask to go back on. So last slide. I've shown you all the intricates ins and outs of PKC. I've showed you how it's regulated by mTORC2 and how it's also regulated by this quality control mechanism. And I've mentioned that if you do anything to perturb the processing inhibitor 2, PDK1, binding to chaperones, intrinsic catalytic activity of the enzyme, it's going to get shunted to degradation. So for cancer, it's important to have strategies that will restore its activity. And this mechanism identifies a few strategies that one could take. For example, this dimer interface right here could be targeted, as we did with the staple peptides, to pull apart PKC to allow PDK1 to bind and allow it to process. So that's one pharmacological target. Another one is by inhibiting the negative regulator FLIP. So if you inhibit FLIP, you're going to be able to accumulate higher levels of PKC in the cell. And then lastly, I briefly alluded to these ataxia mutations in the C1B domain, which render the enzyme stable to degradation. So there could be small molecules that one could engineer to mask ubiquitination or E3 ligase binding sites. So most importantly, I would like to thank the people in my lab that did the work. This photograph, by the way, was taken in March, a few days before this lockdown that nobody expected. So it's our hashtag last normal photo. And it was a group reunion for a lot of the students that were still in the area. And right at the back of the table is Tim Baffey, who did most of the work that I uh, talked about. Uh, Kayla Pilo in this uh, picture at the back here also did some work with the, um, with the ataxia mutations. And I'd like to thank all our collaborators, and especially Kanan, whose um, help with the bioinformatics analysis over many, many years has really um, been very informative in our work. And I would like to thank you for your attention.